describe these events. And on top of that, uh, on Thursday, tomorrow, we're going to have a second day of uh, Global Justice Day. We're going to be discussing the Palestine-Israel conflict with Phyllis Bennis, uh, and a very knowledgeable speaker on the issue. So if you're free tomorrow at 1 o'clock, we'd love to have you attend that event as well. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Longmire was supposed to be the moderator, but she's not well, so I will be uh, moderating the event. And uh, we might begin, I guess, with Professor Fritz. Did you want to talk about the uh, slideshow? Great. Oh, I might mention one other thing. Uh, people uh, who have uh, faculty having their students here, please sign in in the back when uh, before you leave. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mel Malconi, and I uh, appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to be here to speak uh, with you all today. Thanks for my class for showing up, appreciate it. And I know there's a couple other classes here, Dr. Jensen's class is here, right, so, and others. Thanks for coming. Um, before uh, Dr. Eisenberg and I get into um, sort of our takes on, on all of this, I wanted to just give some background, because not everybody might be intimately familiar with the war, what's happened, what's going on, where things stand today. So this is just like a brief, hopefully five minute type of thing. Um, this is, that what's up here now is Ukraine in 2014, before the invasion. Um, this shows that Crimea was already annexed. The, the area um, here is the uh, where uh, Russian-backed separatists had uh, uh, claimed this land in Ukraine. Um, the overall European security context is important um, beyond this. What we have next here is a map of Europe that gets to one of the main issues of, of European security, NATO membership and NATO expansion after the end of the Cold War. Right? And this puts into context sort of Russia um, in this sense. And we have NATO countries here. Of course, the US would be, if to, to the left, would be much bigger state in there. NATO is, uh, US is part of this. Um, but what we see is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, is, is there a bad feedback on this? Sorry. Is that any better? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Um, the, the context of this, of course, is partly that Russia has claimed that NATO expansion has caused it to fight what it says is a defensive war to prevent uh, Ukraine from joining NATO. Um, and, you know, we see sort of this expansion um, in the 1990s through the aughts and, and others. We can see that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, has in fact expanded to Russia's doorstep in a lot of ways. Um, and Ukraine would be even closer to this. And in 2008, the George W. Bush administration did push for a statement that says Ukraine should be given a type of membership action plan um, to, to bring Ukraine in. Um, didn't wasn't widely supported by other NATO members and things like this, but it certainly that statement was out there. So this is part of the larger context, all before the war starts, right? Where we're thinking about this, this the European security infrastructure and framework. And crucially, I think I want to repeat that this was part of the Russian argument for why it was necessary to launch this war. There are lots of other reasons too that we'll get to um, as well, but. Um, that, that I think in fact are, are more powerful, more important um, in a lot of ways. And will tell us more about the direction of where this is going and why US policy is what it is. But this context again is important. So it's within this context that the February 24th, 2022 invasion begins, right? And this gives us a sense of sort of what Russia was doing just over a year ago, invading Ukraine, launching its, what it called a special military operation. It didn't, does not call it a war. Um, what we see from these arrows are large numbers of troops on the order of 180,000 or so that were going into to Ukraine, trying to capture territory. The top line here, this was the direct uh, route to Kyiv to try to take the capital of Ukraine. Um, the Ukrainian military pushed this back, held it off, and what we get um, is a situation where sort of, 
things morph over time to this. This first picture is, pre, is, is 2014 to 2022, February 2022. This second picture here, this is the initial Russian invasion of February 2022 and all of the Russian gains that were made by the military. Very quick, this is about 20% of the Ukrainian territory was taken by uh, the Russian military. What we've seen since then is this back and forth between Russia and Ukraine and, and, and these military operations from the Ukrainian side bolstered by American as well as other NATO allies support where by October of 2022, Ukraine had been able to retake some of the territory it had lost to Russia. This is where we are today in the sense that Ukraine has taken back significant chunks of territory from Russian forces. Um, Russia still has just under 20% or so of Ukrainian territory under occupation. This is just a blow up of, of that, um, along with sites, most recent sites of Russian missile attacks throughout the entirety of Ukraine. What we have going on right now in the situation today is the line of control in these different areas where the Russian and, and Ukrainian forces are actually fighting is essentially World War I style trench warfare that's, that's occurring. Uh, sometimes where Russian and, and Ukrainian soldiers are within 50 feet of each other. There are reports that Russian and Ukrainian soldiers are fighting not with guns but hand-to-hand -hand combat because they're so close with each other at times. This is a brutal, ugly war. The casualties that we've seen um, are somewhere on the order, it depends on where you uh, get the, the figures, but the U.S. military estimates that Russia has lost, either killed or wounded, uh, Russia suffered at least 100,000 killed or wounded soldiers so far. Others put it much higher, at maybe 200,000. Um, Ukraine has been very tight-lipped on their casualty count, but the estimates are that it's probably around 100,000 as well, killed or wounded. Um, documented, there are at least 9,000 civilians that have been killed. That number is probably a lot higher than this. It's probably more like 40, 50, 60, 70,000 civilians that have been killed, Ukrainian civilians. There are millions of refugees that are still, that fled Ukraine at the start of the war that are in Poland mostly, but also in Hungary and other places that they fled. The number is at least six million people, if not more. Um, this war has not really stayed contained just to these two actors either. Just briefly, to get to the U.S. role here, the U.S. has been the most significant contributor to military aid to Ukraine. This number is actually, it's, it's increased since this was published. It's, it's um, another several billion was announced by the Biden administration. Um, but the US by, by far has been the biggest contributor to uh, Ukrainian military equipment essentially and training. What the US has been doing is providing uh, weapons, um, even pledging tanks at this point in time, um, but mostly um, artillery, uh, missiles, air defense systems, and things like this to be able to repel the, the Russian invasion. The UK has done very similar things, and all of these other countries have coordinated these efforts, uh, mostly through the NATO structure as well as the EU. One more figure I want to put up here to show this, because this, this is striking how much the US has been involved with this, of course. But others have been involved significantly as well. If we look at military contributions as a percentage of GDP, very interesting that Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, countries that border Ukraine and Russia, have actually contributed more in terms of what their capabilities are. If we're thinking about Estonia providing over 1% of, of, of their GDP and military aid to Ukraine, um, Estonia is scared of, of this, of, of Ukraine losing, is, is the way to explain this, right? The same with Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, and other actors. So this, War, again, is sort of expanded in a lot of ways, but be beyond just Ukraine and Russia. Um, and yes, this is where the fighting is going on, but there's a lot more to it. That's kind of what Dr. Eisenberg and I want to get to today. Can I just point out, I can't just update my relatives. Sure. <laughs> 
me do this again, right? My relatives that you didn't know you were interested in. Right, so my grandma Jenny, my great aunts, and my grandfather were all immigrants to this country, um, you know, early in the 20th century. And we knew them. And all of the time we were growing up, they s described that they were from Russia. Okay, that's really the point, right? Russia, they never, I think it's fair to say that even though I saw them sometimes like every day, I don't think the word Ukraine ever passed their lips, right? They were Russian, period. And I'm mentioning that not just, you know, to, to satisfy your curiosity about my relatives, but to sort of highlight how complex this really is, right? That we're not just talking about, you know, some random country that's far away from, from Russia or whatever, that part of what makes it such a complicated situation is that the history of Russia and, uh, and Ukraine are all mixed up together in terms of matters of identity. Um, so it's not some quirk of my relatives, but essentially people who lived in that part of Ukraine for decades thought that they were Russian, and Russia thought that they were Russian. And so that partly makes this a more complicated story. It doesn't give us an answer, but it is worth keeping in mind. Okay, I, enough about my relatives. So I think with, with this background, um, and I know there's m so much more we could say, but I, I think we're going to transition to sort of uh, just a discussion between uh, Dr. Eisenberg and I now. So if we could raise the, the uh, stop the projection and raise this. Um, we plan on speaking just for max like 15 minutes each, um, and then we want discussion, um, questions and, and discussion from, from the audience, please. So we'll share our takes and, and our thoughts on this, and then we'll go from there. Thank you. Is it on now? Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So um, you're probably already tired of hearing from me, but Dr. Eisenberg said I should go first in, in this part, too, so I, I will start. Um, you know, like Dr. Eisenberg said, this is extraordinarily complicated war. Um, and if we're thinking, uh, you know, my very simplistic presentation at the beginning sort of laid it out in these easy terms, to, easy to understand terms. But there's nothing easy about understanding this war. Um, what caused it, um, how it might end, and what the U.S. role should be. Um, there are, you know, I, I, so that I, I, I don't have enough time to go through all of the different potential um, causes of this war, the different uh, and weigh all the causal factors that are related to this, but I want to mention a couple because they matter for how this war could end and they matter for what U.S. policy should be. So in international relations, we often break things down into different levels of analysis. We look at individual leaders and their decision making. We look at states and sort of how they operate and that, how that affects their uh, behavior in international politics. And then we look at the international system as a whole and what the constraints and incentives is the, in the system places upon states in different ways that might push them to war. Um, so, you know, very quickly, Vladimir Putin at this individual level plays a key role here. Uh, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia um, for many years now, um, his own decision-making style, his own background, his own personal political uh, aims matter greatly here. Putin is, is on the record as, as saying that he doesn't believe Ukraine is a separate nation, that, that essentially that Russia has the... Uh, responsibility to to sort of bring Ukraine in. He talks about Ukrainian brothers uh, in the sense that that need to, to protect the Slavic brothers within Ukraine. Um, and he himself has sort of, there, there's more to this as well, recently he's thought of himself as the pro protector of the Russian people with an expansive definition of the Russian people, all Russian speakers in the, what is called the near abroad. Um, this is consistent with Putin's statements on the you know, greatest 
catastrophe of the 20th century, according to Putin, was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And really what he was getting to is sort of the collapse of the Russian-dominated Soviet Union, um, a type of Russian imperial structure, if you will. Um, a lot of his statements leading up to the war, um, the invasion in, in February 2022, sort of bolster this, or right? his, his document about the unity of the Slavic people ju released just, between, uh, just before the war, claimed that Ukraine was not a real nation, um, that it only could be a real nation under the guidance of Russia. His decision-making then, really guided by this ide ideology, is, is important. It's also important in the sense of the way that the war worked out. Putin is a autocrat, is a, not quite a, a full authoritarian, is probably a author semi-authoritarian, where he controls most of the levers of power in Russia. Um, he still has people to please, like the military and intelligence services and things like this. Um, but he's also a pretty brutal semi-authoritarian. People who oppose Putin end up falling out of windows uh, quite often. Um, he goes after journalists and others. People are scared to oppose him. When Putin is saying things like, you know, Ukraine needs to be invaded to defend the Russian people, no one wants to tell him no. And this is partly what we saw at the beginning of the war. Um, military leadership was not willing to say no to him, even though sort of, and, and painted a rosy picture of how this war would go. Um, so there's an element of hubris to all of this too, by, by Russian military leadership, that led to sort of this really catastrophic military intervention that did no good for Russia. I mean, losing 200,000 soldiers, for example, in, in a war that they thought was going to be three days, suggest massive miscalculations by an insulated leader who didn't get really honest and good advice from his military leadership. So that's the individual level, and it, it matters when we get to consequences and, and, and where this could go. State level picks up on this at the domestic level, semi-authoritarian semi -authoritarian regime um, is one that has sort of the outward trappings of democracy, like there are elections in Russia, but they just don't matter. Um, controlled by, you know, a, a, a essentially a dictator, but also the oligarchs matter, the military and, and intelligence agencies, as I mentioned before. Um, this type of regime is, is threatened by what? Um, it's threatened by the, uh, of, of things that could undermine its rule, essentially. Um, Ukraine, as it sort of was moving towards the West, um, moving more and more democratic, not a perfect democracy by any stretch of the imagination, but moving this way. This is a, 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 a problem for a regime like Russia in the sense that this is next door. This is, this is a, a state that is moving away, not just moving away, but moving a completely different direction in something that's an alternative model to the Russian model. Um, and that could be threatening to the regime um, in, in some way. So controlling your neighbor in this sense, especially if you have these ideas that you legitimately should be able to control your neighbor uh, for identity and history and other reasons, can lead to the situation where war might make sense. So two contributing factors so far. The interstate level would be more of you know, what we call in international relations the security dilemma, that Russia kept seeing sort of pressures from the outside, the expansion of NATO, and that's partly why I included that map. Um, could be seen as Russia losing security to the West. And the idea that Ukraine joining NATO at some point uh, would just be sort of the worst possible thing uh, in, in some ways. And that this, according to some, including people, uh, famous international relations theorists like John Mearsheimer, is the main cause of the war. I'm not going to sort of weigh um, what I think the main cause of the war is because I don't have time. I will say I, I don't think there's the security dilemma fully explains things and there, there are other models we have to look at. What I'd rather do is think about what all of these things mean for how this war could end and sort of give, or, or what, what it means for where we are today and what it, what, what it um, means for how the war could end. For where we are today, all three of those perspectives, those different levels, the interstate, um, the domestic level, semi-authoritarian regime, and then Putin's own ideology, um, goes a long way in explaining sort of why we're here, where both sides are so deeply entrenched in their positions and there's very little movement. And we continue to see Russia adding more and more and more force to try to take Ukraine because at the individual level, Putin can't lose this war. 
All right, he's, his, his personal rule is threatened if he loses this war. At the state level, the semi-authoritarian regime, the legitimacy of a semi-authoritarian regime is getting results. If you lose this war, you don't have this, those results. At the interstate level, if it is truly being driven by outside forces, well, the outside forces have actually gotten a lot worse for Russia <laughs> since the invasion because NATO is going to expand again. The charts show all of the, the, the um, uh, contributions that have been made to the Ukrainian military and others. So the situation is demonstrably worse for Russia today than it was in February 2014 or 2022 before the invasion. All of these things suggest together, especially when combined with sort of the uh, growth in Ukrainian nationalism since the invasion um, and the leadership of, of uh, uh, President Zelensky, who has staked out maximalist claims too in this war too, by the way, saying that you know, it's, it's not just repelling the Russian invasion, but it's also now going to be about getting Crimea back getting back the area in the Donbass that was taken in 2014, um, that those are the Ukrainian war aims. We're at the situation where there is no bargaining space between the two sides at this point in time. Um, and that's problematic in a lot of ways. If we look, at, if I turn to some literature and sort of where things could end, there's a, there's a whole body of literature called war termination theory um, that, that exact, looks at this type of thing and says, you know, basically, every war does have to end. In fact, that's the title of a famous book by Freddie Clay, Every War Must End. Most wars end in some sort of negotiated settlement, too, and that, that is true. So what are the possibilities of some sort of negotiated settlement coming out of the situation as it is today? Um, unfortunately, war termination theory suggests the possibility is extraordinarily low. Hein Gomans, a political scientist at uh, University of Rochester, has um, a, a, a very useful theory in this sense. And he differentiates the possibility of negotiated settlements to the ends of wars based upon different regime types. What he finds is autocratic regimes and democratic regimes um, are actually very likely to negotiate a, a war ending settlement when both sides are suffering a hurting war. That is, they're, they're suffering high cost and they're not really making any gains. That could be described the situation today in, in, in Ukraine. There's no real gains being made by either side, but the costs are really high. But the problem is, he also finds that semi-authoritarian regimes, roughly Russia, have the least incentive to negotiate uh, during a hurting war because the regime security itself will be threatened if they don't gain the maximum that they can from the war. In fact, what happens, according to this research, is that most of the time we see these semi-authoritarian regimes go for a strategy called a gamble for resurrection. They continue to pump more and more and more resources into the war effort because that's the only option they have is win or die, essentially, when we're talking about this kind of, of regime. Um, with the mobilization of Russian forces, the additional mobilization of Russian forces, and the continued sort of just throwing all of these conscripts into the meat grinder of the, the front in Ukraine, this seems to be very clearly where, where Putin is going with this. Um, so there's, there's, there's this problem. Um, where one side probably is extremely unlikely to negotiate. Now, that doesn't mean that Ukraine is extremely likely to negotiate either. Those nationalist factors really matter, and Zelensky's own domestic legitimacy might be hurt if he in enters into anything that is seen less than his maximalist goals. So we're at this deadlock. Um, but even let's imagine for a moment that we get out of this deadlock. So magically, I don't know how, but something happens. There's a black swan event nobody can predict, and, and they come to the negotiating table. What we've seen and what the war has created is essentially a giant commitment problem from both sides. Um, commitment problems in political science, we talk about these that you know, everybody knows the negotiated settlement is better for them and for everyone else. But the problem is that there are always incentives to cheat on any agreement that is, is constructed. Russia, by the very act of, of invading Ukraine, has made it difficult for anybody to believe a credible commitment that he wouldn't do the same thing again. But it's, and it's not just because of Russia and Putin, it's also a structural issue. It's, Russia is the strongest actor, or stronger actor in this scenario, where it, it dwarfs Ukraine in so many ways. Stronger actors always have a hard time of credibly committing themselves to restraining their future behavior. Um, 
Ukraine is, 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 is also has a credible commitment problem as well because it has these incentives to try to gain back territory. So, so even if there's some sort of settlement that emerges in the next month, um, neither side is probably going to, it, it, it holds much faith that it's, it's going to provide for a durable settlement. So I think a lot of this suggests that we're, if, if this stuff is right, um, that we're in for an even longer slog of, of this war, that it's, it's probably not going to end anytime soon on good terms, independent of what the US or the UN or Turkey or, or any other outside actor does. Um, and that raises then real questions about sort of, you know, what should the US be doing in, in this regard? Should it continue to send so much money and, and aid to Ukraine? Um, should it try to uh, uh, think about other options, um, diplomatic uh, innovations that, that could solve this? Um, those are important questions for us to, to be asking. So um, I probably went on a little too long. I apologize, but I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Eisenberg now. Okay, hi. So you should warn me when we're doing it. Um, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about this talk, and um, I was thinking how, f I don't know about, you know, you folks, but I think that this Ukraine situation, which is actually extraordinarily dangerous and significant, feels still like a million miles away. You know, and I think about other situations like Vietnam or, you know, the ridiculous invasion, appalling invasion of Iraq, you know, where, you know, American troops were in Iraq. So, you know, I can remember being here and there were a lot of students who had family members in Iraq and, um, or friends from high school that were in Iraq or whatever. This is like very, feels very remote and it feels very complicated. So to some extent, I think there's a natural inclination to just like tune it all out because it's far away, complicated, I don't know. Um, so I feel like that's probably somewhere in the room. And if I didn't teach foreign policy, I'd probably push it away also. Um, but what I want to turn to, uh, you know, is not so much the speculation about, um, you know, possible outcomes, because the truth is we don't know. Um, you know, I think that the thrust of Paul's remarks which were pretty pessimistic, I, you know, may, may very well be right. I mean, and one of the things is he and I don't agree with each other, but this is the third time <laughs> that we've done an event, and every time we do it, the situation gets worse. So I can hardly wait for the fourth event. Um, I want to just say, you, well, two things. One of the things that's impressed me, and, and I'm also teaching an honors college with political science people, and I'm really, impressed about the difference between historians and political scientists. I actually started out with political science and fled, um, which is, I think, a kind of rejection of theory and more of a focus on what actually happens. You know, like what are the relevant facts in any given situation? What do they point to? And I think, um, you know, speaking for myself, I've done two very major projects uh, on post-1945 American po foreign policy. Um, one on the origins of the Cold War in Europe and the other um, on, on U.S. policy in Southeast Asia. And one comment I just wanted to mention, you know, really quickly, because it's really on my mind. You know, Paul was saying, well, you know, authoritarian regimes or semi-authoritarian regimes, they have a lot of trouble making peace. And having just finished a book about the U.S. and Vietnam, I find it hard to believe that any country surpasses us, right? Here was a war that the United States engaged in for more than 10 years that looked like it wasn't going to work out from almost the beginning, kept going on because no American president wanted to be the person to lose Vietnam. And while that project was going on and people, US Washington wasn't backing out, maybe 3 million Asians died and 58,000 Americans died. And 100,000 Americans at least came home with serious physical and mental injuries for a war that this government was incapable of bringing to an end, even though the outcome was clear for years. So I'm not sure that we could actually extrapolate from a governing structure you know, what, in fact, um, you know, is likely to happen. Um, 
So that's number one. Second thing, I just want to say a little bit about where I'm coming from on this, and that could be a reason for you to listen or to be skeptical. Um, so, uh, and, and nothing that either of us said should be seen as gospel. Really, the most important message I think we probably agree about is that you guys need to keep reading about this and forming your own opinion and even being willing to act on what your opinion is and not have just two people you know, tell you what to, you know, what to think about. But I just want to mention uh, a couple of things that are also weighing on me as I think have experienced and watched the crisis in Ukraine. So one thing that, I, that, that weighs on me is the knowledge that since 1945, the United States has, in, has had as an important goal having military supremacy in this world. Not sharing, but being number one. That has been a consistent goal of the United States. Whatever the military doctrine was at any given moment, whether it's nuclear weapons, conventional weapons, or whatever, that has been an, uh, an abiding uh, purpose of U.S. policy. And it continues to be the purpose of U.S. policy. The second thing that weighs on me is an awareness that the United States' willingness to deploy military power and to build military alliances unmatched by any other country in the world, has had a lot of backfiring events. And I'm going to just do one more digression before we you know, get to the main point. But um, I want to just say a word about NATO. Now, if you pick up a newspaper now and you see something about NATO, it's always like wonderful NATO. It's a little boring, but who could object to NATO? You know, it seems like it's just, you know, there, it's the wallpaper, nothing to worry about. But, you know, actually, when you look back at the formation of NATO back in 1949 when it happened, there were a lot of downsides about creating NATO. One myth that we have in this country is that NATO was created because an iron curtain had dropped on Eastern Europe, and therefore you needed NATO. But actually, when you look back on it, yes, the Russians you know, were, had military presence in many East European countries. They were often authoritarian. You know, these things are true. But it's also true that the Iron Curtain wasn't down yet, that there were a lot of places, including East Germany, Berlin, Hungary. There were a lot of places where the situation was still very fluid. And back at that time, there were people who said, you know what? having a military alliance now is a bad idea. Why is that? Because if we have that military alliance, it's going to make the situation in Eastern Europe even more oppressive than it already is. And it's going to foreclose our ability to you know, open more air there. And that, the people who said that were kind of you know, brushed aside, and NATO was created, and the situation in Germany and throughout Eastern Europe got way worse than it was in the first place. Um, so I'm bringing that up because I think sometimes we just sort of assume that military power or alliances, that these things are always wonderful. And we're not really trained to, you know, to think of the harmful effects that some of that military activity could actually have. And I want to just say one other thing, and that will exhaust my list of, of, of per, sort of perspective that's operated, which is to say something about the media. You know, three. You could see that I'm. You know, I've been around now for a while. Every time there's been any kind of crisis internationally, our media has just fallen into line, um, and you know, whipped up hysteria, often on the basis of not that much. That so the tendency of our media to just parrot what is being said in Washington has been almost untouched. We, some of you have heard, well, no, now Vietnam didn't we have the media being critical? Not until a couple of million people were already dead so that you had the media being critical. I'm, I'm very serious about that. Um, and and the, 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 uh, you know, the media that we remember from Vietnam are some very big stories, which reporters did break. But basically, for years, the media just repeated what they were saying in Washington. And of course, we're about to be on the anniversary of the Iraq War, and the apparent weapons of mass destruction right, that Iraq had that made it essential that we invade that country, which is still a mess. And again, the media just parroted, you know, what was coming out of the Bush administration. And even when it was clear that the evidence that the administration had that there were weapons of mass destruction, even when it was actually clear that that wasn't true, 
the media continued to whip up American fears with the result that we invaded Iraq. We have thousands of dead Americans there. Iraq has been more destabilized than ever before. More people have died in Iraq, et cetera. So there is that, there is that record. And I think it's, I'm bringing that up in the context of Ukraine because partly what you're seeing in the media is that Putin, who I'm not you know, a big Putin defender, but he's being described as like the wickedest person that ever lived. The wickedest person that ever lived. And the things that Putin has done never happened before. And you know, it's because I was writing this book for 20 years, my floor in my study is covered with documents about US war crimes in Vietnam. Covered with documents about that. None of which you know, ever really got uh, adjudicated in any serious way. One, you know, 500 people killed in Milai, one American punished slightly for that. And if you're reading the paper now, you could actually see, by the way, that the Pentagon is resisting turning evidence of Russian war crimes to the International Criminal Court. Why is that? Because if we do that, it might open the door for, um, for then the cr other countries in the criminal court to actually say, hey, what about American war crimes? that they've been mentioned. There are war crimes in Afghanistan. There are war crimes in Iraq. The US has refused to submit that to international authority. So I'm bringing that up, not to just like you know, set up a different score, but really to make an important point, which is that the demonization of Putin that's going on is t at such a level that it's making all of us feel that he's the worst person that ever was, and we can't negotiate with him. Right? And that's why this is serious. That it's creating the impression that we cannot negotiate with him because he is so much more evil than any person we've ever seen in the thought. He is What he does is terrible. And I don't want you to hear this as a defense of Putin. But what is to this, that horrible as he may be, that doesn't preclude the necessity for negotiations. So I just want to turn more practically to the question of what should the US be doing? Uh, right? We don't know exactly what the outcome is. Paul may be right that it's very negative, but it seems to me it's pretty clear that the thing that would be best is if right now there was a ceasefire and negotiations began tomorrow, that that would be the best thing. And to get to that best thing, the United States would have to exert pressure on Ukraine. Right? That's a touchy issue. I mean, we should probably all you know, go back and forth about that. I mean, obviously it's not gonna happen if the US exerts no pressure. It's certainly not gonna happen if the United States keeps giving them weapons every week, more and more weapons. Um, I mean, it's not just the case that this war is being perpetuated by, by Putin and by Zelensky, right? The US is making it possible for Ukraine to keep fighting. Um, so would that work? Would American pressure at this point be effective? I don't know. But if you ask yourself the question, what should be done? What's important? What should we be focusing on? I think the answer is ceasefire and negotiations. Now, there are many objections to that approach. And I, I imagine some of you folks will, you know, Paul has some, I think, and some of you will as well. But you know, this isn't like a no-brainer. It's a complex issue. But why should there be a ceasefire and negotiations? Why is that even desirable? And I would say really for two reasons. First of all, the longer this war goes on, the more people are dead, right? The more people have died. And, um, and to what end? You know, I was, I was talking about the fact that Paul and I have this thing that every, the situation is always worse every time we get together. But it's going to keep getting worse. So the more it goes on without any kind of negotiation, the more inflamed the participants become, the harder it is for us to pull back, right? So from just this humanitarian standpoint, um, just from that standpoint alone, the faster we brought this war to an end, the better off everybody will be. And the second reason is because what's happening now is profoundly dangerous to all of us sitting in this room. Because I think as Paul acknowledges, Putin can't lose. He cannot lose. And so if it should occur, that Ukraine is inflicting um, more and more effective blows on the Russian troops, and I don't know that that's really going to happen, but if that, that's what the US officials want. They want Putin to have his forces completely humiliated and defeated. But he's not going to let that happen. He will escalate. 
or there's every reason to think that he will escalate at that point. And if it becomes necessary to use a tactical nuclear weapon, that could happen. But in addition, there's chances of accidents. You know, the, the, uh, inter somebody from the International Atomic Energy Commission was speaking the other day. There's a nuclear reactor in Ukraine that could blow up and spread radioactive material all across you know, Western Europe. Right? That could happen by accident. Nobody planned to blow it. So it's da there's m there really are multiple dangers of letting this thing go and having a situation that many of us right now can tune out if we want because we have 100 other things to worry about. Right? Um, but it's too dangerous to let this go on. It's too dangerous for Americans to keep pumping arms into that situation. If White House alters its policy and approach. Do we know for sure that it will result in a ceasefire? Do we know for sure that we're going to have a negotiated settlement? We don't. But every indication is that the Biden administration is positioning itself to be the hawks, right? So Biden's looking heroic. He goes secretly into Kiev and you know, poses there and so forth. Lots of people, Democrats and Republicans, are getting a lot of political you know, power, weight, seriousness, whatever, by posing about how strong and hawkish and how much they hate Putin. It's irrelevant. It's safer for all of us if they stop the war. And finally, I think the question is, one of the, and, and, and it's, it's very worrisome, is it may be the case that the only way that the White House is going to change its policy is when the people of the United States say, change the policy, right? That there's real pressure and organization to bring this thing to an end. Is that going to happen? I don't know. But it seems to me, based on you know, everything we can see every day, the situation gets worse, and the White House and Washington should not be feeding that. Did I go over again? OK. I think what we should do is give the audience a chance to ask questions or to respond to the speakers. So. Other questions that people would like to ask? In terms of the hawkishness Speak to of the mic, please. In terms of the hawkishness of the, of the situation, the most recent thing that has happened that I've heard of is that the Russians, drone, the Russians took down a drone over the Black Sea. Is that hawkishness on the Russians' part? Is that, I'm sorry, didn't, is that? The hawkishness, you, uh, you said the hawkishness was on the part of the Russians, and that, that can be seen. And Biden, I don't, in my view, he is not, be, Biden was not terribly hawkish unless he blew up <laughs> the pipeline, that would sound very hawkish to me. Do, do, you, do you believe he's done that? And now do you think because the pipeline was blown up, they're now taking down, the Russians are now taking down a, U, a U.S. drone over the Black Sea? Do you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, so <clears throat> in, in terms of the overall hawkishness and sort of who's being more and less, I, 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 I don't know if I'll can address that. But what I can say sort of with the latest incident of, of the drone being taken down, this is very consistent with Russian behavior of any U.S. or, or allied uh, uh, operations in the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea. This has happened over and over and over again, uh, where Russian planes have buzzed U.S. military uh, ships and planes and other things. Just last year, there was a B-52 that was buzzed over the Black Sea, sort of you know fighter jet within 100 feet of a B-52. That's, that's really dangerous behavior. Um, but it's consistent. It ha this has actually not changed with the war. Um, it might be maybe they got a little closer because they knew it was a drone and, and they have this other dynamic going on. Um, but this has just been consistent Russian behavior. Um, trying, I mean, what they're trying to do is make a point, right, that the U.S. shouldn't be there is, is what the Russian point is. So, um, you know, with, uh, with other types of things of, of whether there's, there's – um, issues with the pipeline and things like this. We still don't know this. There's evidence that might suggest Ukrainians have something to do with this, um, which would be really problematic for the U.S. Um, but in overall hawkishness, I do think that, you know, maybe if 
maybe we'll say something about that. The U.S. has been very slow and very careful and steady about how much support it's given Ukraine. It started out saying, you know, we can't do this. We can't do this. We don't want to cross these lines. It's tried to delineate this. Now, have we gone past the point that is acceptable by promising tanks and maybe even having Ukrainian pilots in the U.S. training on F-16s? That's a legitimate question to be asking um, in terms of what the U.S. Pr approach is because each of those steps does get us further and further involved. Um, I, I want to sidestep some of your question in this, just in the respect that um, that the spirit of my remarks is not, you know, to, to say that, you know, that to justify things that Putin is doing. Um, but I also think if we're going to talk about hawkishness, that you can't start the story the day that the invasion of Ukraine began. Um, and just to make this point clear, I want to do a very fast analogy. I was teaching a class um, on the Cuban Missile Crisis this fall. And the class begins with Kennedy discovering that the Russians have missiles in Cuba. right? And immediately, his, his view is they can't be allowed to have missiles in Cuba. And if, have, if we have to go to war, I'm going to take them out. And, every, and I remember I asked my class, well, do you think Kennedy was right? Should, it, should he be willing to go to war to get the missiles out of Cuba? Right? And every person in the class said Kennedy was right. Because you can't have a threat that close to the United States um, and allow that to, to continue to exist. And similarly, the, you, you have to think about U.S. policy as it has evolved from 1989 forward, which is that instead of taking the opportunity when the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union dissolved to try to build a new security structure that would include Russia, and which Russia was interested in doing, we did the opposite. Took advantage of the, Russia's weakness to expand NATO taking in the countries of the Warsaw Pact, taking in the places that had formerly been part of the, of the Soviet Union, making them all part of NATO, and holding out the direct possibility, not even a possibility, probability, that Ukraine, which has a thousand mile border with Russia, would come into a Western alliance. So if we're trying to think about you know, ways out of this situation, we can't just start the clock at, you know, yesterday or even you know two years ago, we have to look at that larger history, and it's not for the point of view of pay, of of, um, of uh, blame, who do you blame for this, right? You know, it's not just an exercise of who's the worst person, which is the worst country, which is the worst leader. We're not doing it for that, but to help us figure out a way that we're going to get out of it. And it does seem to me that any successful negotiation that's going to take place between Russia and Ukraine has also got to address the question of the overall security structures for Europe. And it does have to address the issue of NATO. It also has to address the fact that the United States has withdrawn from two of the three nuclear treaties that had it actually signed. So all that has to come into the picture. Um, again, there's no, her there's no heroes in this story, all right? But there are dangers in this story, and that's really what we should be keeping our mind on, I think, are the, the real dangers if we don't change how we're approaching this. Paul, would you like to respond? I would. <laughs> um, so, and, in, 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 you know, I, I, I think you're bringing up very important issues here, but, I, but if we're going to talk about hawkishness, we do need to talk about Russian behavior and hawkishness, too. 2014, the annexation of Crimea, taking over Donbass. Uh, 2008, the war Russia launched against Georgia. Um, the brutal war that Putin launched in Chechnya against you know, Russian citizens, right, that were separatists. We have a history of behavior on this side, too, with what was considered the so-called near abroad um, with, with Putin. And this isn't to demonize him. This is to say that this is a part of the pattern of behavior as well. The other thing that I would bring up in terms of NATO, and, and I, I accept that you know, maybe you need to think about the larger uh, European infrastructure, uh, security infrastructure and, and, and what's going on here. But you, the, the, we have to give agency to those countries that want to be part of NATO. Nobody's ever forced to be part of NATO. Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Romania, Bulgaria. Um, all of these, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all of these states wanted to be in NATO. And why did they want to be in NATO? Because they had been suppressed by the Soviet Union and they're worried about Russian dominance again. 
um, the, the, is there, is, was there safety uh, uh, valve in a sense, right? I mean, th and, and if we think about NATO having n not expanded after the end of the Cold War, well, what would, let's do a counter, if essentially you're presenting this counterfactual that, you know, Russia wouldn't have done this had NATO not been expanded. Well, another counterfactual is that if had NATO not expanded, maybe Poland is now back under the arm of a renewed and resurgent Russia. Maybe, you know, the Baltic states are not part of the EU anymore. These states that made the choice to join the West. And I think we have to give agency to those states. Is, 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 it's, it's not, it can't be just a U.S. and Russia dynamic. Well, it isn't, but you know, the fact that other countries want to join a military alliance does not create an obligation on the people in the alliance to include them. Um, and what it does create, as I think, an obligation is for ev all countries and the leaders of all countries to think about what are the arrangements that can be made internationally that are most likely to guarantee the safety of people around the world. And you know we can go back and forth about this, really. Um, but I mean, if you were going to compare the question of, you know, how many times and places since 1945 has the U.S. sent troops into a foreign country, mm -hmm. uh, with you know the thinnest of rationales, as opposed to how many times have the Russians gone into a foreign country? And you know we have this illusion that they're always invading places, but in actuality they had Eastern Europe primarily as a consequence of World War II, Russians have been very conservative. So we can go back and forth about this, but again, I think that the critical point is where does the U.S. go from now? Do we just keep putting more weapons in Ukraine's hands and say it's up to Zelensky to decide until something really disastrous happens that you know, goes beyond Ukraine and begins to call in all Western Europe? Do we go along with that? Or do we do everything possible to find some kind of compromise solution, which does, I think, it can't just be a compromise for Ukraine. That's probably not going to work for lots of reasons. And the Russians would be very difficult to get them to agree. Right? It has to deal with the entire security structure that exists in Europe. And I do want to remind people about you know, it going, taking us back for a minute to the 1990s, right, when Bill Clinton was president, that Russia had, that Gorbachev had been promised that if, you know, if he allowed Germany to be reunified and also permitted Germany to vote on whether they wanted to be part of NATO, knowing that they would, right, and that was part of the understanding was that the U.S. would then made it clear they were not going to expand NATO beyond Germany. And, and Bill Clinton just walked away from that agreement. But even having said that history, because I am a historian, so we focus on these things, you still have to ask yourself the question, how are we going to get out of this now? How are we going to get out of it without having you know, a, some nuclear incident that makes all of Europe you know, an explosive continent with immense harm to other people, or, or an accident around that reactor? How are we going to get out of this now? And I think that's the essential question. And I think there is no other answer but to push for negotiation. OK, the next question, please. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here. Um, do either of you think that this war could potentially end in a stalemate akin to what happened in Korea in the 1950s? You want to comment on that? Um, so, uh, interesting question. I, uh, different context in some ways, but um, you know, it, something similar would not be out of the realm of possibility. In fact, it might be quite likely that we get there. So, there's this whole series of so-called frozen conflicts in Central Asia and former Soviet space, essentially. Um, that both sides just kind of, they're there, they're disputed over land, and there are people on both sides aiming guns at each other, but they don't fight that often. Um, you know, that might be one of the most likely outcomes in some ways if, if both sides exhaust themselves, that it could turn into sort of this frozen conflict, which, by the way, would serve if NATO expansion is actually the Russian uh, reason for this and uh, for the invasion in the first place, and which I, I don't think it is, but if it actually were, that would serve Russian interests perfectly because that would mean Ukraine would never, ever get into NATO. Because no, NATO is never going to bring in a country that has a territorial dispute with Russia because that would be effectively declaring war on Russia. So strategically, sort of having this stalemate fits perfectly uh, 
if we are thinking of, of Putin's uh, logic in those terms. You know, I, I actually, you know, I, I think when we get to the question of what could happen, what are the possibilities, I think honestly none of us, you know, really, really knows it. My guess, and I'm just putting it forward as a guess, is that we're not going to get a stalemate. And I'm also, my guess, which again I label as such, is really that um, in the end that the Russians are likely to do more damage to the Ukrainian military. It does, you know, for the last year, you've had a lot of people in Washington saying, you know, oh, we can win and so forth and so on. If I had to guess, I think it could, would, would come out differently because just that the Russians have so much more military power than Ukraine, even with the U.S. giving the level of supplies that you know we are. But I don't really know that. And again, I, you know, I keep coming back to this question of you know what is the safest course of action, um, and 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 what is the thing that's most likely to have the least numbers of people killed, you know, cities de devastated, you know, no, you know, getting rid of a nuclear danger. I, I still think that there's no alternative but negotiation sooner rather than later before more people have died. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I, I was very compelled by uh, what you said, Dr. Eisenberg, about um, how negotiations seem to be the best way forward. I think that um, – the complexity of the issue kind of makes it seem, at least to me, that we need a bit of a reductive solution. Um, so aside from, aside from the, uh, like, where to lay the blame, right, I, I'm, I'm not very concerned with that. I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Fritz, um, if we're going to just do a basic utilitarian calculation, right, um, it seems that uh, negotiation is the best way forward, right? Um, I'm wondering if you have a, a direct response to that, like if you have an alternative that, that you think is uh, more suitable. So one, I think negotiations are great. I love diplomacy and negotiations. I do think that that's ultimately the best way forward, but in this context now, I don't know what we're talking about and who what, what we're saying. So if we say there's a ceasefire right now and there's negotiations, does this mean for the Ukrainian people that they've lost 20% of their country um, and their national self-determination is effectively taken away because of this? Does it mean that Russia retreats to 2014 borders, right, including the Donbass and Crimea and other places? Um, you know, because we do have to think about issues of justice on Global Justice Day, in that sense too, what a just peace is. So, but but I think that affects utilitarian calculations in the sense because the perspective of, of utilitarian calculations sort of matters in this sense. So overall, in terms of number of people dying, yeah, stop the war. The easiest way to do that, by the way, is just for Russia to stop fighting the war because they are the ones who invade it, um, a sovereign country. So that that is the that could literally happen today. Um, where that there were people stopped dying in this war, it's not going to happen, right? And I'm not trying to lay blame, but that is sort of Russia invaded Ukraine, right? That is that that is the fact. Um, but I so I think it's a really important question that you're 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 asking. I think it's a really important point that Dr. Eisenberg is bringing. That the biggest concern we should have is about the larger threat of of a war, uh, the threat of a larger war happening, which is a real possibility, and just getting people to stop dying. Um, but I don't think we can look at it in this way and uh, without sort of thinking about, okay, so say we do that and we just freeze it where it is today. Russia keeps what it has. What does that mean about the concept of national self-determination and sovereignty going forward? Does that mean that any time a great power just really wants to take over another country that it can, right? What sorts of negative consequences does that have down the road? Now, of course, we have to acknowledge the U.S. has done this, right? So <laughs> you know, it doesn't, but it doesn't make it right in either situation, right? So I, 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 I have trouble framing it purely utilitarian in that sense because of those kinds of issues, even though I think it's an important consideration. No, but even if you, um, I mean, the, the point of, of acknowledging that the United States has sent troops all over the place, has overthrown governments on many continents, 
you know, has kept troops, some of whom are committing war crimes for which they've never been made responsible. You know, we could, you know, list those things. Um, I'm not bringing those up, you know, as a way of saying that what the Russians are doing in Ukraine is okay. Right? I, I really want to be clear about that. I think it's very much not okay. But a ceasefire doesn't mean that the situation stays frozen. A ceasefire is literally stop killing each other and let's see what we can bargain about. Right? So, I, so, so treating a ceasefire as if it's just a freeze really isn't the situation. And I think, you know, just based on our you know, ongoing dialogue with each other, you know, is that I think the proof is that every time we get together, the situation is worse and harder to resolve. And so if there's not a ceasefire, you know, soon, the situation when we have our next conversation is going to, more people will have died, more horrible war crimes will have been committed, right, et cetera. So I think we look at the overall situation. What should the U.S. do? Do we just keep giving weapons to Ukraine or we do something to make everybody safer? Does that make Ukrainians safer? Does, is, are you, I it mean, might. are you saying that, that Putin yes. is going to stop the war if the U.S. stops arming Ukraine? I, well, a ceasefire doesn't mean, oh, we'll stop shooting and you can do whatever you please. But you did also say that Putin has to win this war. In a he negotiation, you have to give something up. There's a loss associated with negotiation. So I, I and just... And there's a game. I, there's a game so, with So what is that game? Well, number one, if you if if we could get them to see, I mean, I recognize that getting Zelensky to agree to a ceasefire, right, or Putin right now is a challenge. I must say, oh, you know, all that Biden, Biden has to do is call him up on the phone and say, you know, it's fine, right? Um, you know, so, but again, it it is a safer thing to do. I, you know, I don't, and, and it doesn't mean that the exact place where the troops are at whatever moment you have a ceasefire, that they just stay there. There could be a lot of different things on the table. And especially, again, if you widen the discussion to not just be you know, territory in Ukraine, random territory, but think about the overall security structure for Europe, I think it you know, creates some oxygen so that some kinds of deals could be made. But to think that negotiate that insisting on a ceasefire means that we're selling out the Ukrainians, I don't think it's true. There's a lot of dead Ukrainians right now, There's a, and we don't really know how they feel. I mean, the American press every single day is like going on about war crimes and brave Ukrainians and so forth and so on. And I'm not just counting that, but you know, have you we heard from people in Ukraine who are saying they just killed my husband, they just killed my son? Could you please stop doing this? We're not hearing those voices, but I think we could be sure there are plenty of them out there. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Thank you again, and both. For, uh, thank you again, and both for uh, coming today. So I just had a quick question. There's speculation now that G is actually going to possibly meet with Zelensky sometime this week, and this will be the first time since the war has broken out that China has had direct communication with Ukraine. So obviously with how big of a player they are with both the United States and Russia, I was curious, what role do you think that China can play overall in this conflict? He has to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. It's a hard question. I haven't heard that she was, was, was planning yeah. this, so um, I, that's new to me. If it's true, um, given sort of what happened with Iran and Saudi Arabia and China brokering sort of what appears to be a rapprochement there, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be surprising because China's um, slowly sort of started to expand its diplomatic um, presence in, in, in the world in a number of ways. But it also would be, I mean, you know, given the, the start of the war, just before the war started, she and Putin had a, you know, put out this statement about how their friendship was... I, what's the term? It was a, it's a, no no limits to the friendship. I mean, this the bromance between she and, and Putin in some way. Um, so that would be a little surprising in that regard. But if if it happened, it would be a heck of a signal to Putin that um, China doesn't necessarily have there that there are real limits to this partnership. Um, which I think have already kind of been exposed in the sense that China's just you know taken advantage of of Russia by. Uh, 
Russia has to sell oil and gas, right? So um, for it's really only its only real source of income. So China got a really good deal on Russian oil and gas. China has taken advantage and, and played to their own interest. Um, this could be an interesting move if it is. But again, I, I that's kind of just all speculation, but um, it wouldn't be inconsistent with recent uh, Chinese behavior if that's the motivation. Thank you. Next question. Okay, so uh, yesterday, one of the chief adherents to the Putin Admiration Society, uh, Ron DeSantis, uh, essentially stated that Ukraine was outside the uh, U.S. sphere of influence, uh, that uh, Ukraine is not a, a serious security uh, risk, you know, to American foreign policy. Um, so that being the case, fast forward to the election of 24, uh, and either a DeSantis or a Trump or somebody uh, with a like-minded view of U.S. foreign policy becomes president. Uh, now, under those circumstances, and you showed us on the uh, you know, the, the, the one of the introductory charts that um, the tremendous preponderance of uh, of, uh, of of aid to to, to Ukraine is, is the U.S. Uh, so now, with a president like those I just mentioned, uh, there's a, uh, you know a, a a much more limited contribution, or maybe no contribution, uh, from the U.S. to the Ukraine. Under those circumstances, what happens uh, to NATO with a diminished or no U.S. president uh, presence? Um, and what happens to Ukraine uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, if, if, if NATO remains as a force, uh, the European contribution, given that it's so small a percentage uh, of, of the contribution today? I really want to give them all the hard questions. <laughs> well, I think, it, look, it's it's an interesting question. I think we have some indication of sort of what might this look like um, from the Trump presidency, because Trump questioned the value of NATO um, very clearly um, and uh, questioned Article 5, all of these things that NATO seems to sort of value. Um, but at the same time, sort of uh, – Russia's invasion of Ukraine has jump-started NATO and, and activities, and we're seeing more increased defense spending. So thinking ahead, if you see dwindling American support for NATO, um, it's a slightly different situation, and Ukraine, I should say. It might be a slightly different situation in 2024 than it would, is, w was in 20, than it would have been in, say, 2020 or 2022 when there were still sort of these fissures within NATO. And NATO is more unified now than it has been in – <laughs> maybe since 1949, I'm not sure. Um, and you're seeing uh, states uh, step up their defense spending significantly because they, they are wondering if there could be someplace next. Now, can they completely replace U.S. contributions? No. Um, so, you know, it changes the dynamics in a lot of ways. And I think it will be an interesting – the domestic politics in the U.S. are going to have some real impact here in terms of – if we're still, if this war is still going in 2024, um, which I think it might be, um, U.S. domestic politics are going to have a huge impact in that way. You know, I, I think I, I mean I always have a list of about 10 things to worry about, and the possibility of DeSantis becoming the president and changing U.S. policy dramatically. I have it like low on my list of worries, like about 20. Uh, and the and, you know and for a couple of reasons. First of all, he as soon as he's uh, you know he's competing for the Trump base, right? And as soon as he uttered these words, immediately most other Republicans jumped on him right away. So I would be even surprised if, as the election, you know, as as the primaries go on, if you're going to even hear DeSantis saying, you know, that sort of thing about well, we you know we got to pull back from Ukraine. I, I think that would be very surprising if he actually stays in there. And one of the things that we haven't talked about at all today, which is also relevant to DeSantis, 
is how much money the American arms industry is making. They're making a fortune right now from Ukraine, right? I mean, business has never been that good. And if you think that those businesses are going to sit back, you know, and have somebody become a serious candidate for president of the United States who thinks that they're going to stop that, flow of money you know, into their coffers, I, I would be most surprised about it. But also just really worried about what will happen in the next, you know, in the next two years. Um, you, you know, because the immediate situation is really heartbreaking, right? Uh, you know, again, heartbreaking from, you know, how many of these Russian soldiers don't even want to be there, right? They're just like getting dragged by Putin into this war that they, you know, most of them don't really appear to care about at all. And what's happening in the cities um, so, I mean, to me, that's still like what is right in front of us, and that nuclear reactor sitting there is right, you know, is right in front of us. I want to just say one more quick thing and then let you ask your question. You know, um, again, you know, we're, we're up here, you know, talking about a very complicated um, situation, and we do have a different point of view. Um, and I tend to be much more just, you know, I, I feel when the mass media goes off on one of these crises, I think it's very unreliable. Um, and I think that U.S. militarism has much more to do with the situation we're in now than is being acknowledged. And that war crimes are what happens when you have wars, whether it's the U.S. that does it or Russia. You know, all those things. And, and Paul is giving a much more measured, you know, approach. But I really think that... Um, hopefully, you know, that this event that we're having right now will not stimulate you to agree with one of us, but really to say, you know, I'd like to know something about it because it actually has implications for my future and, and I want to learn more and figure out what I think about it. This will be the last question, but let me just add one thing about the costs of the war that has not been mentioned. Aside from the massive military budget increase that is taking place and will continue to take place over the next year or two. There are huge costs associated with inflation. The fact that Russian oil and agricultural goods and materials have been sanctioned has meant a very high increase in inflationary pressures, which affect not only Americans, but many people of the global south who will go hungry, and that will be another casualty of the war. Other people who will die, aside from the people, the actors in, in the Ukraine, Russians and Ukrainians. Last question. Thank you, professors, both for coming here today. I wanted to ask, what would happen to the state of Russia in the event that Ukraine was able to take back all of its currently recognized territory and hold on to it? It's it's a really good question, Matthew. Yeah. It's a tough one, um, you know, because the, if if the theories revolving around regime survivability uh, for semi-authoritarian regimes are correct, it doesn't look good in terms of the survivability of the Putin regime. Um, and in that sense, if Putin is out, the most you get you someone is going to come in and replace him. There's not going to be a democratic revolution in that scenario, um, and you're likely to see someone. Um, more dictatorial than Putin, because Putin's biggest pressure, for example, is not from his left or an anti-war movement, but but from the right, from the ultra-nationalist. Um, and they're the ones who are upset right now with, and, uh, with, with Russian policy and the way the war is going. Um, you know, so if, if we're talking about the regime, that's one thing, but we're, we're also talking, it depends on, you know, if, if if just Ukraine gets its land back, this doesn't imply massive cost like a loss of territorial sovereignty to Russia. So those costs are relatively low um, in that regard. So, but it's probably important for, at least I would like to distinguish between the regime and, and sort of the state in that regard um, as I try to answer that. You know, one of the things that um, is sort of weighing on me and thinking about what's happening now um, is that many years ago I was giving a talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis and oddly enough in the audience was Khrushchev's granddaughter and after she, when I finished she came over and we went to lunch and one of the things she said is that in her family the family view 
was that Khrushchev backed down on the Cuban Missile Crisis, knowing that the result of that would probably be that he would lose power. You know, so that, that's like the family story. You know, that he he was worried about Kennedy, didn't trust Kennedy to be conservative, so he took the fall. That's, you know, so that may be all made up, but anyway, that is how she, you know, described it in the family. She's actually been on television, you know, saying some similar thing. That, but I think if you think about Putin and you ask yourself the question, would he behave like Khrushchev on a matter that, you know, right, because after all, Cuba was very, very far from Russian territory, right? For Khrushchev to give in, it was a humiliation, but it didn't have any lasting effect. When you're talking about going to war in Ukraine and losing it, and you're thinking about Putin, what is he going to do? What is he likely to do? And I think that's much scarier. You know? So one of the things I hope people understand is I'm not speaking today as a defender of Putin at all. But I think even to the extent that we have deep concerns about him, that's a reason to be cautious, I think, not to be um, respond in a military way. Thank you. Uh, I think our session is about over. Before you go, I'd like to thank our two speakers for wonderful presentations.